Thank you uh, for the kind introduction. Uh, my name is Fak Eiler and I will be uh, telling you about yet another novel material system, uh, namely transition monolayer transition metal dichocodulates, and on how to integrate them with optical fibers and some interesting experiments in optics photonics we've done in these and we've recently done this hybrid and nonlinear system. So, um, so the material in question uh, for today is this uh, transition metal dichocodulates. It's somewhat similar to um, graphene in, in the sense that it forms monolayer crystals, with the difference that this monolayer crystal is not a single layer of um, atoms, but it consists of unit cells of three atoms, namely a charcoal layer on the top, a and transition metal layer in the center and a charge layer at the bottom. And these materials are very, very interesting for optics and photonics because they are semiconductors and with a particular quirk that if you transition from the bulk, so from the multi-layer system to the monolayer system, they transition from an indirect to a direct band gap, as you can see on the left-hand side on this screen from the uh, from the uh, energy band structure, you see this uh, on the top here for the bulk, which is an indirect transition at the bottom, you have a direct transition at the K point. And of course, this change from indirect to a direct transition um, enhances a lot of light matter interaction effects rather drastically, as you can see here, for example, from a photoluminescence spectrum, right? So you excite your material with short wavelength light, and then if you have a monolayer crystal, and uh, you observe this nice and very, very strong photoluminescence in the, uh, in the red, this is at 670 nanometers, as opposed to if you have a two-layer crystal, then this photoluminescence is uh, very, very negligible. And this photoluminescence is driven by electron hole pairs, uh, which are frequently called excitons. And um, now this is not all of the effects which these materials have, which are interesting for optics and photonics, and I'm not going to go through all the other effects which are of interest as well. I'd just like to convince you that each of these effects would lend themselves uh, very nicely for um, applications in optics and photonics. However, um, you can't just use the materials by themselves. You first of all have to fabricate these materials and you have to integrate them with optical systems. Yeah? And you have to do so in a scalable manner because the state of the art at the moment is still transfer from bulk material. And of course, this is something which does not lend itself for, for many applications. So the um, approach we pursue is we use a mechanical vapor deposition where you basically take vapors of a charcogenite, in this case it's sulfur, and of your transition metals, and then you bring them in contact with your growth substrate uh, in, a, in a reactor in a specific uh, circumstance. And if you do everything right, you will observe growth of monolayer crystals on your substrates. Yeah? There's an example here on the bottom left. These are monolayer crystals of molybdenum sulfide. Um, you can also change the composition of your precursors during the growth and then you can for example also uh, create um, heterostructures in this case we have heterostructure of molybdenum selenide in the center and on the outside it's tungsten selenide and the transition edge between the two if the pn junction if you so wish yeah, is um, of epitaxial quality now these materials are all van der Waals materials which means out of plane, they only bind very, very weakly. Yeah? And this has a profound impact on growth, namely that they will grow in almost all uh, materials, irrespective of their epitaxial compatibility. And so in this case, the growth is on silicon dioxide, which is of course not crystalline at all, but you still observe this crystalline growth modes. What's maybe even more profound is that you can grow them also on non-planar structures. So they just they grow both non-epitaxially and also conformally. And therefore, this approach lends itself very nicely to direct integration with photonic circuits. And the simplest photonic circuit you can think about, I guess, is an optical fiber. So this is exactly what we did. We took a special kind of optical fiber, which you can see on the left-hand side here. 
um, in a cross section. So you have the fiber extending out of the screen and the gray area is silicon dioxide, so it's glass, yeah? and all the dark areas are air. Now the photonically interesting thing uh, part happens in the center of the fiber here, yeah? where you have a guiding core, which is made of silicon dioxide, and you have an optical mode that propagates in this core, and it's surrounded by air. The important part here is that the top surface yeah, is exposed to the outside world, and if you place it in your CVD reactor, you will um, observe growth of transition metal dichocogenite crystals on the surface. And this can interact with your guided mode by means of the evanescent field of this guided mode, which kind of sticks a bit out into the, um, in, into the air region and therefore interacts with your transition metal dichocogenite. And um, we have tested this approach works for quite a lot of transition metal dichocogenites. In one image you can see on the right hand side, so you have the optical fiber here. So in the experiment, light propagates this way. Yeah. This entire thing has a diameter of roughly 200 micrometers, and you see these nice monolayer crystals being grown on the optical fiber. Now, at first you need to convince yourself that these crystals that you observe really are monolayer crystals. So we measured quite a lot of AFM and uh, uh, AFM and Raman maps, and what you basically see is under the AFM, you get a height of these crystals of about 0.7 nanometer, which is just what you expect for a monolayer, and you get a Raman shift of 20.5 uh, per centimeter, which is also what you would expect from a monolayer. So we've confirmed that we really have a conformal growth of monolayers on these fibers, and as a next step, we'll also look into the electronic properties. And to better understand that, we measure the photoluminescence and compare it with the photoluminescence from crystals which are grown on planar substrates. Yeah? So the photoluminescence map, again, this is our optical fiber. Optical fiber is now basically placed in this direction. You look at it from the side, you make a photoluminescence map of the core region and you see this nice monolayer crystals here. Yeah? And if you take a spectrum here or there, then you typically get uh, curves which look like that, which are pretty much identical from the monolayer crystals on the bulk surface, yeah? uh, peak at 670 and full with half marks of roughly 40 nanometers. So basically we see strong BL and put good quality of the monolayers. Now we're good to go to actually measure, to actually do in-fiber experiments. Yeah? So we take a light source, we focus the light source in the optic core, we propagate light down the and uh, down the optical fibers and then we observe what is coming out of the other side using cameras and spectrometers or we observe the light which is emitted sideways using the camera. So we use sideways emission basically for determining the area coverage of our MOS2 on the optical fibers. We can basically just count the number of photoluminescence peaks and for this specific fiber I'm going to show you the results here today. We basically found that we have roughly 5% area coverage and the total amount of crystals on an 18 millimeter long fiber, 18 millimeter long fiber of roughly one millimeter. Yeah, now keep in mind, usually you have to do transmission experiments with transition metal dichocogenite, so you have an interaction length of, um, of one nanometer, and now we have an interaction length of one millimeter, which is like a six orders of magnitudes increase. Okay. So, as a first thing, we uh, were looking into, uh, into photoluminescence. So, we look at the exit port of the fiber, we send it through a few long pass filters, and you get this nice spot of light which is emerging from the core of the optical fiber. And you can then measure a spectrum from this, and depending on which material of the fiber you really see these nice photoluminescence peaks, which just look like the photoluminescence peaks from your pristine material, which is grown in planar substrate. Yeah, so we have basically now excited excitons through the fiber, and we've also collected the emission light again in the fiber mode, which means that we can actually do in-fiber experiments with this kind of system. The second effect that we um, looked into is second harmonic generation. 
And you're probably aware that optical fibers do not show second harmonics simply because they're made of glass, which is an amorphous substance and therefore it does not have a kind of nonlinearity. Any kind of second harmonic that you actually see in optical fibers, which is usually almost negligible, comes from um, optical surfaces or from some contaminations. So, and what we've done is we've basically taken our fibers yeah, and uh, we have measured second harmonic in here. So what you see are the solid lines. Sorry. What you see are the solid lines at the bottom, which is the 50 times increased second harmonic spectrum from the bare optical fibers. And then you have the second harmonic from, um, um, from our optical fiber, which is much, much stronger than this. So overall, we observe a much a more than three orders of magnitude enhanced second harmonic generation as opposed to the bare optical fiber from our coated optical fibers. We also see nice kind of power dependence with a slope of two. Yeah? Funnily enough, we see more second harmonic light coming from a shorter piece of fiber as opposed to a longer piece of fiber, which points to the fact that due to the very, very dense coverage um, of, of the fiber with these crystals, we are actually somewhat limited by the optical loss in the second harmonic. Moreover, our system is not phase matched yet at the moment. So we believe that if we go to a regime where we have phase matching, currently investigating various methods to do so, that we may see another three or maybe four or five orders of magnitude enhancement in the second harmonic yet. So as a summary, I've tried to convince you that um, using monolayer growth directly in optical fibers, we can produce a hybrid system where we can access the properties of transition metal to collagenides directly in a guided wave environment. And that we can really interrogate the monolayer properties through an optical fiber, yeah, which therefore kind of is a new uh, platform for experiments in optics photonics with these 2D materials. And I have demonstrated for you today like strong second harmonic generation and also in fiber photoluminescence. What we've also done is we've looked into enhanced third harmonic generation, but due to the time limitations of the talk, I have not spoken about this today. So thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take questions.